Hi everyone and thanks for joining us for this webinar on finding a cause for your child's hearing loss. My name is Anne Porter and I am the CEO of Aussie Deaf Kids. It is my great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Valerie Sung, who will be talking about finding a cause for your child's hearing loss. Valerie is a paediatrician at the Royal Children's Hospital um, in Melbourne, clinical scientist fellow and team leader at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and honorary clinical associate professor at the University of Melbourne. And she also somehow manages to juggle kids and a family. I've come to know Valerie through our membership on the Australasian Newborn Hearing Screening Committee and know how passionate she is about finding ways to help deaf and hard of hearing children reach their best outcomes and potentials. She is also a champion for making her research findings accessible and meaningful to families. Unfortunately, um, I once again messed up um, with the record button for this webinar. So I have narrated the presentation from the caption notes for the first couple of slides. My apologies. So this is Valerie. I'd like to thank you for inviting me along. As you mentioned, I am really passionate about translating our research to a practical kind of level. So thank you for coming tonight to hear about this. Just a little bit on the outline of what I'll be talking about. A little bit of background on the CHAMP network and also a few kind of reasons why we might want to find out a medical cause. It's not for everybody, but it's available. I'll be talking about the options that are available specifically in Australia, and also the pros and cons of finding out. So we all know that Australia, we are in a very lucky country in that we've got very high quality universal newborn hearing screening. There's no doubt about that. But the pathway beyond that can be a little bit challenging for families because from my experience, at least when I started out in this field, it seemed that medical management was quite suboptimal and that it was managed by a variety of people. And often health professionals have very limited topic in this area in terms of medical testing. And as a consequence, we see a lot of over and under investigations. The Childhood Hearing Australasian Medical Professionals Network was uh, established in 2016, and we're a group of more than 40 doctors around the country and New Zealand with a special interest in looking after children with hearing loss. And our aim is to optimise and improve care of deaf and hard of hearing children and their families. And um, you can find out a bit more about us um, through this website. Um, and we, um, the first thing that we wanted really to do was to set up some national guidelines because we knew that um, everybody was doing things very differently. So we wanted it also to be relevant to our, you know, to our local kind of um, perspective. Um, we wanted to create some uni uniformity in caring for these children, minimize any unnecessary tests and give guidance to health professionals in choosing the best tests. And we also wanted specifically to use a very common sense approach because often, you know, guidelines are guidelines, but, um, you know, there are factors that need to be factored in when using guidelines as well. So these are some of the um, doctors who are in the CHAMP group. There's just some of them. I've kind of um, collaged them all in, in, in one, you know, nowadays with Zoom, you can actually take, cap take a caption of um, everybody here. So we actually come from all over Australia and New Zealand. I think we have pretty much a representative from every state. And we've got ENT surgeon, pediatricians and geneticists in the group. The aims of our guidelines was to, first of all, guide clinicians on the most appropriate management, reduce any unnecessary testing, exclude any nasty conditions, guide prognosis and management, 
help families come to term with the diagnosis and overall hopefully reduce the burden on families. So why do we want to do testing in the first place? I guess the most immediate reason is that we want to find causes that really matter and can change management. And these are some of the more important causes that um, we want to try to exclude in a child who is um, deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. In terms of structural abnormalities, we're talking, I guess, about the inner ear um, or the brain. So for example, if we know that a child does not have a cochlear nerve, which is the hearing nerve, we know that um, putting a hearing aid or a cochlear implant may not be very effective for the child. So that will, can guide management. And there are also specific um, unusual uh, structural abnormalities of the cochlea, which means that sometimes putting cochlear implants may not be the best option. We of course also want to exclude any underlying brain lesions. Now this is extremely rare, of course, but um, you know always important to exclude. And the third one on there is enlarged vestibular aqueducts. And some of you may already know what this is, but for those of you who have not heard of that, it's a structural issue of the inner ear. And there's a, a picture of um, the cochlea and the cochlea has these ducts coming out because the endolymphatic ducts and the endolymphatic sacs. Um, and this particular condition is an enlargement of these vestibular aqueducts or endolymphatic sac. Um, the reason why we're interested in this or pick up this condition is because the hearing can really fluctuate. It can actually progress over time. And sometimes you can have what we call a conductive component to it, um, where you know it's not just a sensory neural hearing loss, but a conductive hearing loss as well. The main thing that we want to know why for this condition is because we know in rare circumstances, the hearing can suddenly deteriorate if there's minimal head trauma or there's a, you know, a huge change in pressure. So for children who have this condition, we usually advise them not to participate in high impact contact sports. By that, I mean boxing, where you know, you're deliberately hitting the head or professional footy. I guess there's more and more you know, in the media now about um, you know, head injury from footy and other contact sports. Um, we you know, often say may, maybe not professional gymnastics. Obviously you need to be pragmatic about what the child wants to do and what the child doesn't want to do. Um, but you know, perhaps a professional kind of Olympic style gymnastics is not a good idea. Um, and scuba diving or skydiving may not be great either. And if, if we know about this condition, we can also sometimes give treatment to reduce progression of hearing loss. The evidence for this is not very strong, but um, most of us would consider a course of um, oral medication with steroids to try and rescue any drop in hearing level um, if it does happen for this condition. So a good time to, I guess, exclude this condition is when the child enters the school um, age kind of um, time period, because that's when the child starts to choose what extracurricular activities they might want to do. Less important, I guess, for preschool children. The other condition we want to find or exclude is Pendritt syndrome. And Pendritt syndrome is a a few different conditions in, in, in one kind of constellation it includes hearing loss, thyroid enlargement or goiter, where there's, there's a swelling in front of the neck, enlarged vestibular aqueducts. Often there can be abnormalities in the cochlea um, and the child can have problems with balance because of vestibular dysfunction. So that's um, you know, all related, I guess, to the inner ear, the middle ear. And often this has a genetic basis. This is the, the most common gene that's associated with Pendritt syndrome. Um, and so, you know, if we find this as a cause, then often we do need to look out for thyroid enlargement um, and look out for other problems associated with it. 
You may have um, heard more about Usher syndrome. It's the leading cause of deaf blindness. And there are many genes that have been found to be associated with Usher syndrome nowadays, but um, these are the two more common ones. How we can find it is by looking into the eye. So we can look at the back of the eye at the retina, which is at the very back. And on the picture here, um, the left is the normal retina and the right hand side is what we call retinitis pigmentosa. So the retina has got pigments on it and that's quite classical of Usher syndrome. Um, these children not only develop or have progressive vision loss, uh, uh, you know, and also some have progressive hearing loss, um, they also can you know, be affected by balance problems with the vestibular dysfunction as well. So knowing about this really helps with, I guess, um, dictating how the child is managed and the prognosis of the child and how to prepare the child um, going forward. The other important condition, which is very rare and really only occurs in children who have bilateral profound hearing loss, is a condition called Gerbil and Lange Nielsen syndrome, where there's an issue with the heart rhythm and it can be associated with a sudden death. So, you know, obviously we don't want this to happen and we want to be able to pick this condition up and there is treatment for it. Um, so we would advise, you know, any child who have a bilateral profound hearing loss to, to have a heart rhythm trace just to make sure they don't have this condition. The last um, condition I had on the list is congenital CMV. And this has become more and more, I guess, um, in the news and um, there's more awareness around it. It is the most common infectious cause of hearing loss. Um, and it's usually acquired during pregnancy. And it accounts for actually 15 to 20% of bilateral um, moderate to profound hearing loss. And the hearing can fluctuate and progress with time as well. The significant thing with this condition is that in recent years, we have discovered an antiviral treatment that can be given to the babies who have symptomatic CMV. By symptomatic, I mean the baby's actually usually sick at birth and they don't just have a hearing loss. They usually have other symptoms like they have a rash or they're you know, going to the nursery um, in special care and they need ventilation and they're, you know, pretty unwell looking. Um, there was a study that looked at these children with CMV at birth and you know, by giving them this treatment, the hearing loss actually um, did not progress as much as the control group and the developmental outcomes were also improved. However, we actually still don't know whether treating babies with isolated hearing loss with these antiviral therapies will be helpful or not. And this really requires further research. And um, there's been more and more, I guess, programs around the country where we're trying to identify CMV early so that we can look at how and whether treating these babies early will help them in the future. These are some of the names, I guess, of the group that published the paper on, um, on these guidelines. And we made these recommendations based on whether the child had hearing loss on both sides or just on one side, the clinical presentation. We wanted to gather evidence from the literature as well, and also consider any limited resource settings and family preferences. So this is a, you know, a good cartoon. Offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head, but just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests. Well, I think as doctors, we want to really avoid this because you know it's we don't want to order tests just for the sake of it. We want to order tests only if it helps, only if it changes management, and only if there's an indication. So the first um, test that we usually recommend is an MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging. And on the on the picture there, you can see a lovely. Um, Kid-friendly MRI, I must say, we probably don't find this everywhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where this one um, sits, actually. It might be not in Australia or New Zealand. Um, but we feel that MRI is actually indicated for all children, but it just depends on when we do the MRI. 
And I'll just go through the reasons in a second. Um, the diagnostic yield or the likelihood of finding a cause for a one-sided hearing loss is actually really high. So um, often children who have a one-sided hearing loss, um, we may be able to find structural issues like, you know, if, if the nerve is not there or if there's a cochlear abnormality on the MRI, that will help us with how we advise a management. Um, an MRI is required pre-cochlear implant surgery. So for all children who have a profound hearing loss who may need a cochlear implant, they need an MRI anyway. An MRI is useful to exclude the condition of the enlarged vestibular aqueducts, which I talked about before, because of you know, just trying to make sure that the child can you know, participate in contact sports. And it's useful pro for prognostic counseling. So an MRI um, does not um, emit any irradiation, so it's extremely safe. And this is in contrast to a CT scan. Um, so we would not recommend a CT scan as first line nowadays, whereas in the past, some children would have a CT scan. Um, but we usually say ha have an MRI as first line because it doesn't have any irradiation issues. Um, and in terms of when, you can see this picture on the right here is a baby having an MRI, and we can often do that under what we call a feed and wrap situation, where we can feed the baby if they're young enough, um, wrap them up, tuck them up, and when they're really nice and comfortable and sleeping, we can put them through the scan. And the scan usually takes 30 to 40 minutes for the ear images. Um, so as you can imagine, the younger the baby, the easier it is to do a feed and wrap MRI. If you can't do a feed and wrap MRI, sometimes you can give the baby some sedation with some oral medication that can help, help soothe them and calm them down, and that can avoid a general anesthetic. Um, but for other children who are older, often we have to use a general anesthetic to help them stay still for 30 to 40 minutes. So that's a pretty big deal, and we don't recommend that for all children. We usually would recommend, as soon as we can, do an um, MRI for children who have a one-sided hearing loss because the yield from that is much higher, and for those who have a severe to profound loss on both sides because of the um, possibility of having cochlear implants. Because if we do it early enough, then we might be able to avoid a general anesthetic later on. However, if we kind of miss that time period where the baby can lie still, that's okay um, because there's not many other things where doing an MRI is going to change management. The main thing is picking up enlarged vestibular aqueducts, which is not until um, school years. So we would say that if you've missed out on doing a feed and wrap MRI and it can't be done as a little baby, that's all right. We can do that without a general anesthetic when they're at school if we still haven't found a cause. And that's on condition that we don't have progressive hearing loss where we do need to find out a bit sooner or there are other things going on with the child. Um, so the, I guess the take home message with MRI is if you happen to be in a place where MRI is available when the baby is young, then yes, a feed and wrap would be the simplest and easiest way of doing it. If we miss out on it, that's not a, a big issue unless you have a profound loss and you need cochlear implants, in which case we might need to do it, um, you know, a little bit later on down the track when the child can actually lie still in the scan without any general anesthetic. The second test that we recommend is CMV testing. And I already um, mentioned before that CMV is the most common infectious cause of hearing loss. The, um, I guess the advantages of finding out, there are of course advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of finding out could be that you may have, you know, if it's negative, you have some closure to that. It's, it's not because, you know, you, you might have picked up a, a, a virus during pregnancy. Um, and if we exclude it also, we may be able to, you know, say, well, there's one less cause for a progressive hearing loss. A saliva swap within three weeks of birth is ideal, but it's not available everywhere at the moment, unfortunately. Um, most of the centers who are doing it are doing them as trials at the moment in Australia. 
There are states in the US where it's mandatory to do targeted um, screening for CMV. So if you lived in the US, for example, you're more likely to have a saliva swap within three weeks of birth. But I'm hoping that with more and more research, we will get there as well in Australia. If we don't have the availability of a saliva swap within three weeks, and the three week cutoff is because any sample taken from, from the baby after three weeks may suggest a postnatal infection. So CMV is a very common virus. It sits around, you can pick it up at any time and you may not have any symptoms from it. Um, and often you can pick it up after the baby's been born. It can be um, present in breast milk and the baby can um, get the CMV after birth, in which case it actually doesn't affect the hearing. So any sample taking after three weeks is not very reliable. Um, and we can't use those samples to determine whether the child had congenital CMV, which causes the hearing loss. So if we see a child beyond three weeks who hasn't had this test, we can go back to the newborn blood spot, which is the, called the Guthrie card. And you can see the Guthrie card there on the right. All babies in Australia and New Zealand have the Guthrie card at birth. And they're usually stored for a period of time. And we often can go back to that card beyond three weeks to look for the virus on that piece of paper, on that blood. And of course, the accuracy of that is less than, you know, if you did that swap at birth, um, but it's better than nothing. So if it was positive on that piece of card, on that paper, then it's most likely that that blood spot did contain the virus at birth and it was likely the cause of the hearing loss. Um, and I did say, you know, possible treatment with antiviral medication, but that's really a possible treatment because we still don't know whether treatment actually works. So there's still a lot of trials going on around the world to look at whether this is beneficial. When Anne asked me to give this talk, she actually asked me about genetic testing. And this is a hot topic and um, genetic testing has been evolving rapidly. Um, just to note that genetic testing really depends, is a very personal preference. So it's not that we would recommend or advise parents to have it done, um, but we would give parents the information so that they have the information on board to make an informed decision. So why, why would we consider genetic testing? Well, some parents want to understand why. Some, for some parents, it helps them find closure and remove, remove any guilt. Sometimes we have a lot of guilt over what happened during pregnancy and what you know, might have may not have happened. And you know, having the genetic test can, sometimes can reduce that. For some families, it can um, help with family planning if they are you know, planning on more children. For some families, you can understand the child's future and what to expect and also whether to expect other medical conditions um, in the future. And for some children, doing the genetic test can actually direct medical management as well. Oh, just stuck. Oh, there you go. I'll go back. So in terms of causes of hearing loss, in fact, gene a genetic cause is the most common for bilateral or both sides, hearing loss on both sides. Um, and accounts for you know, anywhere between 60 to 80%. Um, and in terms of genetic causes, we often kind of divide that into non-syndromic versus syndromic. Syndromic meaning there are other medical features um, that um, are you know, that come along with, with the hearing and non-syndromic, meaning the child only has the hearing loss and nothing else. And for non-syndromic hearing loss, there's just several ways of inheriting a gene for the hearing loss, and that's autosomal recessive, dominant, X-linked, or mitochondria, and I'll go through that. And about 20%, we don't find a cause, or it's because it's um, acquired at birth or after birth, for example, if, you know, a child had meningitis, for example, that can cause the hearing loss. So this is kind of a little diagram of um, what, it, what we mean by genes. So genes are stored in DNA. Um, genes have four bases. They're called A, C, T, and G. And there's a specific order or sequence of bases that determine the exact information carried in each gene. 
And this DNA is packaged into chromosomes. So each cell in a person's body contains a set of chromosomes and therefore a set of genetic instructions. So everybody has usually 23 pairs of chromosomes. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes are matching pair in everyone. And the 23rd pair is the sex chromosome and that helps determine whether you're male or female. So as you can see here, a female has two X chromosomes and the male has one X and one Y chromosome. So one chromosome of each pair is from the person's mother and one chromosome of each pair is from the person's father. Hearing loss is most commonly inherited in an autosomal recessive way. So people who have one copy of a recessive mutation do not have the condition, so they are carriers. So in this diagram, you can see the dark green is the normal copy of the gene and the M, like the, the white one with the green outline is a copy of the recessive mutation. And here, both mum and dad are carriers. They each carry one copy of the recessive mutation, one normal copy. So a child from these parents will have a one in four chance of having a hearing loss because the child, this one on the right-hand side, needs to inherit both copies of the recessive mutation from each of the parent to, be, to have the hearing loss. So the other three chances are that you either have an, you know, no, you're not a carrier or there are two in four chance of being a carrier. So just like the father and the mother. Sometimes less commonly hearing loss can also be inherited in an autosomal dominant way. So a child will have the condition if he or she has one copy of the gene with the dominant mutation. So here in this figure, the usual copy again is the dark, the colored one and the white one is the, the dominant mutation. So the child only needs to inherit one of this to have the hearing loss. Um, and usually in this one, the, 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 the father will have the hearing loss. And you, know, you can see that there's a daughter who has the hearing loss and a son who has the hearing loss. So you have a one in two chance of getting a hearing loss if it's an autosomal dominant. So as you can see, if it's an autosomal dominant inheritance, there will be a family history. So it will run in the family. But often for autosomal recessive inheritance, as you can see, often there is no family history. And in fact, that's the most common scenario in that a um, child with a hearing loss is born to two hearing parents and there's no family history at all. And that's because usually it's recessively inherited. So in terms of genetic testing, there are several ways of looking for mutations. And I'll go through these four different types, um, one by one. Um, you have what we call carrier type, where it's a picture of a person's chromosome that we're looking at. So this diagram just shows, this is on the left, the chromosome or the chromosomal variant. Um, and we're just really looking almost macroscopically at the chromosomes to see whether there's any, you know, deletions or additions or any missing kind of information. The second type is called microarray and it, it, it detects expression of thousands of genes. So that's kind of the next, whoops, next step from, oh, I'm missing a, there you go. So you, you're looking at um, an a, array there of many, many different genes. You can also do single gene testing. So it only tests for one type of mutation. So you can see there, we are only testing for one single gene. And one example of that is connexin mutation testing, which some of you would have had or heard about. Um, GJB2, which is the actual gene, or it stands, um, it actually is a gene that contains instructions for a protein called connexin 26. And connexin 26 plays a role in the functioning of the cochlea. It's the most common genetic cause of hearing loss. It um, you know, accounts for about 20% of hearing loss on both sides. There's also different genes called GJB2, GJB3, GJB6, 
Most of them are recessively inherited. Some are autosomal, autosomal dominantly inherited. Um, but usually it does not cause a one-sided hearing loss. So we don't usually recommend testing with, um, for one-sided hearing loss. In Australia, this is the only funded genetic test by Medicare. So it's the most easily accessible test and usually the first one that we would access if a family is considering genetic testing. The last more complicated way of genetic testing is sequencing. So the C DNA sequence is determined for the entire gene or a certain part of the gene. And one can detect any mutation present in that part of the gene that's examined. So here we are looking at the sequence. So I mentioned the A, T, C, and G. So it depends on the order of how they go. Um, and there's different ways of sequencing. You can do a, you know, gene sequencing, a panel, an exome, or even a genome nowadays. I'm not going to go into the technical terms of those because um, that's just you know, over the top. But um, in terms of sequencing, it's spelling out specific genes of interest to look for sequence variants. So for example, for panel testing, there's, a multiple, there's multiple genes of interest that we can look at one by one. Whereas for an exome or a genome, we can look at a whole lot of disease causing genes. So in terms of exome sequencing, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Lillian Downey, um, completed her PhD on a study that looked at offering whole exome sequencing to 106 children in, in Victoria for bi with bilateral moderate to profound hearing loss and really demonstrated that that kind of testing was able to you know, transform, I guess, our traditional medicine to a personalized medicine um, kind of um, way. So this is the paper that she's published and I've got the link to that um, if, you, if anyone wants that. In terms of her study results, um, 38 out of the 106 families received a diagnosis. So this is you know, much more than um, what we normally would get from just connexin testing. 10 of them were moved to a screening protocol that was tailored to the genetic diagnosis, which means that you know, we could actually um, specifically do um, medical management that's tailored to the child. Two of them had specific treatment that was offered for the condition. And four of them had a complex neurodevelopmental syndrome that was diagnosed that actually helped with informing medical care. And of, for all the um, children who received the diagnosis, we were able to give them, give parents a recurrence risk and also other relatives were able to receive a diagnosis throughout Cascade, through the Cascade testing, which is testing of relatives. So, um, we found that this was um, actually the uptake for this was quite good. A lot of families, um, you know, actually after you know having extensive counselling, um, they you know really wanted to take that up and found that a useful test. So once again, genetic testing depends on your own personal preference. It's not something that needs to be done for sure and doesn't need to be um, you know, done urgently. There's time to think about it. A negative test does not rule out a genetic cause because a negative test might just mean we haven't found the gene. Um, and we also cannot assume that hearing loss is definitely acquired. So you know, in babies who are premature or have CMV, there may actually be an underlying genetic or gene associated. And of course, the whether you know what kind of genetic testing really depends on what's available locally in terms of funding and availability. Dr. Lillian Downey and myself have put in an application to Medicare to try and make the whole exome sequencing equ equitable to all children in Australia, at least, um, because you know we we want children and their families to have this option to access it for free. At the moment, it's actually really costly, and I've actually got a slide at the end about that. Um, there are, of course, some known that risks and some disadvantages of genetic testing. Um, number one is that not all genes that cause hearing loss are known yet, so doing the test may not pick up something that we don't know about yet. At the moment, all this genomic testing is really based on 
bilateral hearing loss or hearing loss on both sides. So we know very little about one sided hearing loss. Often we find chance findings. So a mutation may or may not be the cause and that can cause a lot of anxiety, um, which may or may not be necessarily um, the best thing for the family. Genetic testing can elicit very strong feelings, especially if there's implications for other family members or review other unexpected information. So it's okay. not to be considered lightly um, and needs, you know, a, a family who's considering genetic testing needs to go through a proper genetic counseling in detail before considering the test. There can also be insurance implications. So this is the, um, a, a website that applies to Australia at least. Um, and, you know, we know that um, your health insurance will not be affected, but most life insurance products can be affected and it can impact on the cost or the terms of the policy. So it's not to be taken up lightly and needs to be a considered um, um, decision. What do you do with the genetic, what other things can you do with the genetic information? Well, nowadays there's actually prenatal testing too. So let's say if we found a gene um, and for your child with the hearing loss, then for your next child with, you know, you can actually find out whether that, you know, that unborn baby may have that same gene. There's also pre-implantation genetic testing. So, you know, through IVF, you can actually make sure that the pregnancy does not have that gene. So um, that's kind of an evolving thing, obviously not for everybody, but um, it's now available. The main things I guess to consider are, do parents really want these things? Should carry testing be offered? So there's a lot of research nowadays looking at, you know, when you're pregnant, do you want to know whether you've got this gene, for example? There's a lot of research on doing genomics in newborn screening. So screening all babies um, to, to find the, the, the genes. And also lots of work, I, I guess, around precision therapy for particular genes. So, um, you know, there, there may be in the future, I guess, treatment for these um, specific genes. So just moving on from genetic mutation and just finishing off, um, the other recommendations, one specific one is vision assessment. We believe all children should have a visual acuity or the vision assessed before school because we know that um, having multiple sensory deficits can have compounding effects on the child's learning and behavior, especially in the learning environment. And it's actually really common for children who have a hearing loss to also have vision issues. For some children, we might recommend an ophthalmologist um, see the child. That means an eye doctor. Um, whereas before talking about vision assessment is, you know, you can get that done with an optometrist. So with an eye specialist, you might want to um, see one if you, there's a suspicion of a congenital infection or there's vision problems or if we're suspecting the diagnosis of Usher syndrome. So often these children don't walk by 18 months. They may have poor night vision and low tone and poor coordination. Um, and you know, looking at the back of the eye, often you know, is we are able to make that diagnosis, but usually those changes are quite late you know, when the child is much older. This may of course become unnecessary if genetic testing becomes more widely available because we are able to identify the genes that cause Usher syndrome. Whoops, not sure what happened there, oh, there you go. Um, we also usually recommend all family members have their hearing tested. So that's, um, you know, I think you need a hearing test. What, what the heck do I need a hairy chest? Um, it's really to complete that family tree, but also to, to make sure we haven't missed any siblings who have an undiagnosed hearing loss, who may have a mild or a one-sided hearing loss. These are some parent resources that we've developed from the guidelines. We want it really to make it available to
So I'll go with this a chat there. Um, in children with hearing loss due to a genetic cause, what is the diagnostic yield of the newborn hearing screen? So you're talking about the hearing screen. Um, hearing screen is, um, I guess, picks up hearing loss. It, it is almost, you know, ninety, you know, almost hundred percent, but. Um, it's targeted at moderate to profound hearing loss, although um, you know, right now we're also picking up a lot of mild hearing loss and unilateral hearing loss. Um, I'm not sure whether that's the, I'm answering that question or not. If you already know there's a genetic cause, what, do, what was the percentage of having Pendrick syndrome? Um, Pendrick syndrome is not very common I don't know the exact percentage. I can look it up for you, but um, it, it's not very common. Um, Valerie, I was just um, thinking about MRIs and um, should parents be mm -hmm. um, um, actively um, asking for MRIs at the um, feed and wrap stage? Um, is that, a, should we, you know, be encouraging parents to ask their doctors for that, do you think? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Um, as I mentioned before, the reason why we set up these guidelines is that not many people know about what to do. Um, and often, you know, unless you're in, in, I guess, you're seeing a specialist with a special interest in hearing, um, that person may not know that um, an MRI might be indicated. So I think drawing their attention to these guidelines and, you know, you know, kind of putting the guidelines in front of them is not a bad idea. Um, often there are facilities where you can get to an MRI pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, obviously that does reduce the need for a general anesthetic later on down the track. So yes, I would say yes is the answer, um, if it's possible. But I, I think at the same time, we need to be pragmatic about it. I don't, you know, we don't want everybody to panic that we didn't get an MRI, obviously, mm. um, because we know that, you know, it's not going to immediately change management for most children. Um, but, you know, for children who you have the you know, opportunity and you have the facility, then it's obviously something that can be done. Yep. Yep. And what about, um, I'm just thinking of Usher syndrome where, um, so pe parents still have to pay for that, um, to have that test, don't they? Or is that free? Well, it's actually, I don't know where that slide has gone. There was a slide on, um, let me just go back and see whether I missed it. Ah, there it is. Let me just show this. I don't know why I missed that slide. It must have um, advanced much quicker than I thought. Something happened on my end too, sorry. Ah, oh, good. So I'm just going to go back to this. So these are the, diff on the right-hand side are the different um, costs, I guess, of different panels and um, genetic tests. So we, you know, what we have recommended in our guidelines is exome sequencing because there's now evidence for that because we've run that research study. So we think that if a child has bilateral hearing loss, um, then they should get the connection testing. And if that's negative, then they should be able to move on to exome sequencing. And that cost right now is around $2,000 without Medicare funding. However, if you have what we call a syndromic hearing loss, then you may be able to um, have that done with funding. It really depends on the local genetic service. There are all those options on the right. And as you can see, Invite is actually very cheap. Um, it looks at 200 genes, although it doesn't do the connexin mutation, which, you know, obviously Medicare, we can cover that. Um, and it's $250. So you know, they're just introducing this now and um, it's a pretty new service. So, you know, there's a lot on the horizon, I think, in terms of cheaper genetic options. It used to be that otoscope was the, and then otogenome was the dominant ones and they're pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the next year, actually, there will be 
uh, we're going to be running a research project for auditory neuropathy, where we'll be offering exome sequencing for free for families with children with auditory neuropathy. Um, so there's lots of different options. Um, again, as I said, some local services will fund some things and others will not. So it really depends on what's what you've got in your state. All right. Okay. Um, I did see some more um, questions. So for a part yeah, so there's one from Lauren. Yeah. So for a child being diagnosed with unilateral moderate hearing loss at five, she passed the newborn hearing screen other than an MRI. Are there any other tests you should get? So yes, the MRI is probably the most, the one that would give you most um, yield or bang for bucks, I guess. Um, but the, yes, there are other tests that we would consider. So for example, we would probably send her to the eye doctor to look at the back of her eye um, to make sure she doesn't have usher, although unilateral is less likely for usher. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite rare for a unilateral loss to have progressed with time, but CMV is one of the causes of progressive hearing loss that can affect hearing as time passes. Um, but in, it may be more likely that um, she didn't get picked up because it was unilateral and may have been there all this time and we didn't know about it. Does that answer your question, Lauren? And I'll keep moving then. If you yeah. have already had an MRI for the first cochlear implant, would you need another one for the second? No, usually not because um, the MRI usually can see both sides at once. Um, can you describe fluctuating hearing loss? Would it be the same as getting inconsistent hearing results? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Many of you would have experienced this, that um, sometimes um, getting hearing testing in your kids can be really, really variable um, because it obviously depends on how they react to noise, especially older children. Um, or, you know, especially preschool older children, you know, rather than babies. Um, and when we talk about fluctuating hearing loss, we're not spe specifically talking about inconsistent testing results. We're talking about that actual fluctuation in the hearing. So there are particular conditions like the enlarged vestibular aqueducts where the hearing can actually improve and then get worse and then improve and get worse. And that's got nothing to do with um, the testing itself being not being consistent in terms of not getting consistent responses from the child. Does that answer your question, Meg? It's hard when we've only got it in the it? Sorry. Okay. She says, okay, thanks. That's all right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All good. <laughs> all right. The next one's from, I don't know who it's from. Will the recommend like screening that. and treatment be rolled out to make GP aware? <laughs> Very good question. I've been trying to. <laughs> so it, it was published in a pediatric journal, um, but, um, you know, we are hoping GPs can be made aware of it as well. We've certainly um, been able to make audiologists more aware. I think if audiologists are aware, then naturally they can, you know, inform the family to ask the GP to look it up. Um, we were able to present in several audiology conferences and we wrote in the Audiology Australia magazine and there's been lots of audiologists who are now more aware, I think, of what tests are available. So um, I hope that, you know, slowly people will become more aware. Do you recommend doing private genetic testing or going through public? So um, there's not really any difference, I don't think. Um, maybe a little bit quicker, you might be able to get into a private geneticist. Um, but apart from that, not in terms of the service, I don't think. Will you look at uncommon causes of hearing loss such as caused by spinal anesthesia in the child? Um, that's not specifically one of our research questions, but you know, obviously we are interested in looking for all causes. So one of my research studies is called Big Child and it's a statewide longitudinal data bank 
of children with hearing loss. And we're trying to track them over time and also find out what the different causes of hearing loss are. So, you know, it may be that one day we might find a pattern if we have enough children um, participating in the study. So not at the moment, but maybe. <laughs> Cochlear implants being recommended for profoundly deaf children between 6 to 12 months should be a behavioral hearing test also be done, not just ABR testing. There's, there's yeah, the, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of, um, um, you know, considerations for that. I think ideally, yes. Um, but, you know, obviously it's kind of a balance of getting it in early versus getting in, you know, a little bit later and getting that behavioral testing done. Besides thyroid enlargement with EVA, is there other organs might be affected also later on? Is this in speci specifically in relation to Pendrin or other, any other organs? Is that Laura? Do you want to? Um, in the other region, Pendrin. No, it's mainly thyroid enlargement. And as we, we know that a lot of these children also have vestibular dysfunction. So they have balance, they can have balance problems. And because of the EVA, you can have the, the hearing loss can progress and fluctuate. Um, Matthias is saying, could you have a copy of the presentation slides? And we have recorded this. I think I may have messed it up slightly but it will be available and we'll let um, everybody who registered for the webinar know about that. So um, a sterling job as always, Valerie. Thank you so much for giving us your time and expertise. And um, um, as I said, I'm always in awe of your um, time management, I guess. <laughs> I'm not in awe of my own time management, but, <laughs> but thank you. And, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm available by email. If anybody's got any um, further questions, um, always happy to answer them. And we will put links to the articles and also to the um, information that you did um, that was, you know, sort of focused towards parents. Um, so we'll also, um, provide that information so that people have um, have access to um, to the articles and everything.